Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is David Watson from the UK. Um, I'm the Chief Research Officer for the Honey Ant Project. I've been a Board of Directors member from 2007 to 2012, and um, I'm going to try and tell you very quickly what we've been doing over the last year. Turns out it's quite a big topic, and um, there's quite a lot of information, so I'm going to go very quickly and try and go a sort of whistle-stop tour across everything we've done in the last year. As Christine mentioned, we've developed over the last decade or so a number of concepts, things like honeypots, honey nets. We talk about low interaction, high interaction, ways of capturing data, analyzing data. I'm not going to touch on the details of that. If you are interested, there's a couple of books we've written. Um, that's our only sales pitch today. So we've taken the HoneyNet tools we've developed over time. And as a volunteer group, we've been quite successful in deploying those tools, rolling them out internationally. This is an example of a project called GDH four or five years ago where we built honeypots, um, virtual machines, standardized around the world. We pushed them out to lots of different locations. We gathered the data to a central location. And as uh, volunteers, we've done quite well with that. Taking that to the next level, groups like Shadow Server, Team Cymru, and commercial people like uh, AV vendors or Arbor have taken honeypot tools and scaled them to the next level, where they're collecting many terabytes of data, billions of events, and many tens of millions of binary samples. So where do we as a volunteer group fit in in that spectrum today after 10 years? So this time last year, we were in Paris having our annual workshop where we got together to discuss, we got together to discuss um, what we were going to do for the next year. This is the slides I presented last year. So I'm just going to do a quick uh, review and a recap of what we achieved and what we didn't. So we said that as a volunteer group, we have some funding issues. We have some uh, challenges around uh, scalability and long-term strategic future. But we're pretty good at doing kind of skunk work, small R&D projects. We start new initiatives, we get them going quickly, we develop tools. And we planned last year to try and develop more of these tools in a sort of skunk works kind of style. So we started by creating some priority areas. We called them P1, Priority 1. We had six topics. We set up mailing lists. We had breakout sessions. We discussed what we wanted to do. We tried to draw members in, get them involved, and start uh, new projects. So the areas we were interested in, um, in Paris, we decided were going to be mobile devices. Um, that was a big topic last year. Virtualization, getting data out of honeypots at the virtualization hypervisor layer. Topical malware, things like Stuxnet, SCADA, identifying new topical threats. Active defense research, this is taking down, mitigating active botnets. IPv6, uh, deploying honeypots on IPv6 space and getting our tools ready for IPv6. And distributed data collection, so one of the conversations with our members last year was, was this the right topic? We're all volunteers, we do this as our hobby. Are we working on the right topic? So we have to try and choose areas that also fit with our members' personal interests, what they want to work on, what they think is cool, what they want to do. So we spent the week discussing our topics, and we decided that on the left-hand side, in green, we were going to do Android, mobile, virtualization, topical malware, active defense, and distributed data. We said that IPv6, we had a number of tools that were already available in IPv6, and not as much interest from members in actually deploying those honeypots. Also, social networks, we talked about doing social network honeypots. We decided we probably weren't quite ready, but instead we'll build on the relationships with different organizations. Today we're here at Facebook, so hopefully that shows we're building on those relationships. So our plan was to go away, take notes from meetings, uh, have sessions, plan what we're going to do, and come back. This is our assessment of the results. So what have we actually achieved? So Google Summer of Code, GSOC, is an initiative funded by Google where they sponsor PhD, MSc, BSc students to come and work for three months on projects. We've been involved for the last three years. In our first year, we built a number of existing tools and uh, updated them and built some new tools. We continued that in 2010 with a number of tools you're probably familiar with. And we continued into 2011. So in 2011, we worked on some of our existing tools like Capture, we updated tools like Wireshark, Cuckoo, and Dianea. I'm going to give you some examples of the kind of things we've been doing and also talk about some of the new tools as well. So these slides will be on the public website after the talk. So I'm just zipping through the content. There's a URL at the bottom for each of the tools I'm going to talk about. If you want to see more information, you can download the slides, you can click on the URLs, or come and talk to the members uh, during the sessions today. So some highlights from GSOC. You may be familiar with low interaction honeypots. These are sensors you put on the network. People come to them and attack them. So we used to have Dianea, as I used to have Nepenthes. That's our version one low interaction honeypot. We've replaced that with Dianea. That's a complete rewrite. 
started in 2009, worked on for a number of years now. So it's been completely written. It's now quite uh, enterprise ready. It scales quite well. We deploy quite a few sensors. And it includes things like detecting shell code that's unknown using something called a libemu and using a full SMB stack for detecting unknown attacks as well. So it gives you an ability to log attacks by attackers against your honeypot. You're seeing connections, the payloads, shellcode detection, the exploit download, and capturing the data, OS fingerprinting as well. And it's become quite robust. You can now use uh, much more easy uh, querying languages to get the data out of your honeypot. And you can get Dianea from the website here, dianea.carnivore.it. So one of the extensions was working on a libemu this year. This is a shellcode detection and emulation library. And we had a project with uh, Florian, who was working on um, adding a new uh, hypervisor-based and hardware-based uh, emulator for getting higher performance shellcode extraction. There's some articles on our website about it. The code's still beta. It hasn't been merged into the full libemu trunk yet. But if you're interested in that kind of thing, you can find out more on the URL there. We've also been extending Dynea in other ways. So in 2010, we added support for XMPP. That's a publish subscribe system for sharing data between honeypots. We also looked at adding new types of support for different attacks. At the last workshop, we saw attacks against Microsoft SQL Server. In a discussion in the bar one night, we're talking about how we would extend Dynea. We did this as an example. And we blogged about it. And then, as part of the GSOC work, we've been adding uh, voice over IP support to Dianea. So you can now run your honeypot emulating voice over IP systems. It will actually record attacks against it, record the conversations and the calls people are trying to make using your honeypot. Again, it's on the public website now. If you haven't seen the interface, there's also a web interface available for Dianea as well. So that was for server-side honeypots. For web honeypots, this is people attacking your website and ejecting attacks against it. We started a tool called Grasstop, which is built by Lucas, who's at the front down here. And this is a good example of somebody going from a GSOC student to GSOC mentor to GSOC org admin, who he's now helping with this year. So Grasstop um, is a lightweight uh, web server written in Python, emulates vulnerabilities on your web server. You can get it from the website. We've uh, released the Know Your Tools, a KYT paper. So if you're interested in more about how this works, you can download the paper. And it's a quite a detailed explanation of how the architecture system works, how the different components fit together, different types of attacks, SQL injection, RFI. It has a nice web interface to use. And it shows you how to write plugins to extend it yourself. If you have unknown vulnerabilities, it has a way of trying to emulate those. And we're currently working on a new proposal to extend this further with a next generation version. So as part of GSOC work, we had uh, Grastoff NG next gen uh, last year. There's now going to be a third generation started this year as well. That's work in the pipeline at the moment. We've done things like instant messenger honeypots. Uh, this is, again, project by Lucas. And on the client honeypot side, this is honeypots that go out and look for malicious resources on the internet. We've been working on a tool called uh, a Python honey client, PhonyC, P -honey This has finally been released after a couple of years of work. Um, it's a, a Python program you run from the command line that emulates the web browser goes up to a website, looks for malicious content, and tries to download it and analyze it. It's now become uh, more easily packaged, so you can basically do a, an app to get install type installation. On the client honeypot side, if you're sending a client honeypot to a malicious website, sometimes it detects ActiveX controls. This is a tool called AxMock, developed in GSOC 2011, which emulates uh, unknown or uninstalled ActiveX components. So if the website's trying to exploit you, it plugs them in for you. It's still a work in progress. Then the mobile front, we've been working on Android tools. Um, we're seeing a lot of attacks against mobile devices. So this is a tool called APK Inspector. It's a, a reverse engineering and analysis tool for Android binaries. You take an APK file from the marketplace, download it, analyze it, use this tool to do the analysis. It's still actively developed at the moment. We're hoping to do some more work in GSOC this year. Also, a tool called Droidbox. This is a more dynamic analysis tool for looking at um, Android applications. It's another ongoing development project at the moment. So if you're interested in Android malware and reverse engineering, these are good tools for that purpose. We bundle all these tools together in something called ARE, the Android Reverse Engineering VM. This is a pre-built, downloadable virtual machine that contains all of our current tools and some third-party tools as well. It's all open source software. It's free. 
So if you're interested in reverse engineering Android, this is a great tool set. We've been quite successful in getting this out to the public, getting some kind of media coverage and more interest in the tools. It's actually a hot topic at the moment. In other areas, we've been working on things like botnet monitoring, a uh, GSOC project by Patrick, if he's here. No? Oh, Patrick, yeah. So this is another GSOC project called Hale for botnet monitoring. That was finally released last year. We built a tool called HoneySync, which is a network sinkhole. This is a, a GSOC student called Adam who uh, built a honeypot that will, if you want to sync a botnet, you send the traffic to it, it records the network connections, and allows you to uh, record a lot of data about you, the sync called botnet. Again, it's been quite interesting, a number of certs and people in the industry using it. Another tool we've been working on is anonymization of data. We want to share the data we have from our honeypot with other people. We have a tool called LogAnon for anonymizing log data. It's still a work in progress. And on the sandboxing side, once we've got the malware, what do we do with this malware? Uh, Claudio is over here. He's been working on a uh, uh, Cuckoo sandbox for some time now. Um, it's gone from a basic project to being extended a number of times, and it's still an ongoing piece of development. It's a pretty good tool now. Um, Claudio is teaching some classes on this tomorrow. If you're interested more about it, he's the man to talk to. We've also taken, uh, <laughs> also taken uh, Cuckoo and extended it to become a hosted software as a service. Um, called malware.com. This is a website where you can go like VirusTotal. You can submit a um, binary sample to it. It will do the analysis for you using the Cuckoo engine. So just quickly give some examples. You can submit binaries. You can get analysis of what the file was, different types of signatures. You can get it run through multiple AV engines. The hardware has been donated by Shadow Server. We're using Shadow Server's back end for this. You can see the behavior analysis, what's installed inside the Windows virtual machine when the malware is executed the processes that formed, what the behavior is, the type of network request it's making, um, the signatures of any files that are downloaded, and the drop files from it. So Cook has become a pretty robust way of doing malware analysis. If you're interested, definitely take this tool out. Again, quite a lot of interest in that tool, and uh, Cradio is uh, well on his way to becoming famous from his authoring of Cuckoo. On the network analysis side, um, if you're using tools like Wireshark, we've been extending Wireshark to add capabilities for doing additional analysis. So we added a number of plugins for Wireshark this year. The first one, um, Wireshnork, if you can see at the bottom of the screen, this has a snort signature engine embedded into Wireshark. So you can run snort signatures through Wireshark and see within the user interface integrated snort analysis. We've also built a remote web interface to Wireshark, so you can run it on a remote machine, access it over a browser, and see the Wireshark interface through a web browser. And finally, some uh, reporting of connections and events so trying to model the traffic you're seeing in a more visual way. Again, work in progress. On the visualization side of things, we've been working on tools like PicFizz. This is a tool for parallel coordinate graphs. Uh, Sebastian, who's over at the back over there, he's been working on this for a couple of years now. The idea is using human visual abilities to recognize patterns. So the red lines here are connections between botnets, ASNs, different types of data. And there's a user interface for this, and a white paper on our website which talks you through how to install, configure, and use PicViz. If you're interested, it's a kind of a interesting evolution of visualization tools. The white paper has a lot of information in there, tells you how to build the tool, and Sebastian's going to talk about it next, tomorrow. We also did some GSOC projects on visualization using WebGL. This is a, uh, a web visit, it's called. The idea was to take honeypot data and visualize it in a mesh. You can download this tool from the public website and also some uh, geospatial mapping tools as well for taking honeypot data with a user interface where you can create different types of attacks, see different data, trends, that kind of thing. These are all student projects, but they're um, on we going at the moment. So we don't just GG talk, we do other things as well. So to give you a quick summary of other activity going on, we're still developing our client honeypot that's high interaction called Capture HPC. The Polish guys, if you're here, any from Poland, Polish guys are working on Capture HPC still. You can download that from their website. The Australian Honeypot project are working on their own client Honeypot called Trigona. This is a uh, sort of hybrid, low interaction, high interaction. It was released last, uh, two years ago now. We're still developing it. We're starting to integrate that with Cuckoo at the moment to use Cuckoo as the analysis engine for the Trigona uh, client Honeypot. Uh, last year at the annual workshop in Paris, uh, Tillman at the back spoke about uh, high performance network packet capture. His tools were, the, pre the presentation's done on the website. His, one of the tools released was Streams, which is a TCP stream reassembly tool. That was published um, last year as well. 
And Gil Gifosi from the giraffe chapter talked about um, detecting shellcode at high speed on the line. His presentation is still public as well. And there's been some additions to that. There are now some Python wrappers to libsizzle, which you can download from the MDB Correct website. MDB Correct itself is a high interaction, say, a low interaction server honeypot that's still being developed by Georg. He's still working on that, as he's still working on BotsnoopD, which is a botnet tracking system. If you're interested, get in touch. We can tell you more about these tools. Visualization has been a hot topic for us. Uh, ben, if he's in here, uh, Ben from Australia has been doing a lot of viz work. Um, this is uh, trying to visualize honeypot attacks in different ways using new visualization tools. Um, we've had a number of forensic challenges that Christine mentioned that have uh, encouraged new tools. The last challenge was a visualization challenge. It was great to see the students building new tools that have been released as open source as well. This is not a HoneyNet project tool, but it's a tool written to solve our forensic challenges. So we're excited to see that, and it's a great way of getting new members involved. So um, Angelo from Italy, are you in the room? So Andrew is working on a client honeypot called Thug. I'm not going to steal his thunder, but he's hoping to release uh, this week internally um, and then publicly as well. So I'll let him talk about that when he gets a chance to talk about it. This is hopefully going to replace our existing uh, phony C uh, low interaction client honeypot and be a new high-performance uh, high low interaction honeypot. So one of the things we have been active in is sharing data. So we've been working on a project internally called HP Feeds. So we have a number of data submissions from different types, from Nepenthes sensors, from Dianea, from all different one-to-one -one data exchanges. But we weren't very good as a project in sharing our own internal data. So last year at the workshop, the giraffe chapter, um, uh, Mark and uh, Lucas, presented some ideas about sharing data. So rather than having islands of data within our organization, we should try and bring them together, make it easier for members to use the data. So we looked at using XMPP, because we're using it for Dianea already. But we had some problems with XMPP in terms of binary data. If you want to share arbitrary binary data, XML is not a great uh, format for that. So the idea we had for HP feeds was to take different sources of data, completely arbitrarily. I could define a source, they could define a source, you could define a source, and share it together. So we've been building this internally and testing it for the last 6 12 months. It's a pub-sub mechanism called HP feeds. It doesn't have to have any advanced knowledge of what the payload is. You just define channels, you subscribe, you send data. Um, it's authenticated, users define the data sources, it's got some simple messaging types. And so far we've built some modules for Dianea, for Grassstop, for other of our tools. And internally within the HoneyNet project, we've started to share the data in that way. Um, the code is public. We haven't um, made a big fuss about it yet or promoted it because we're still testing it. But if you're interested in this kind of methodology, um, the code is available. So how are we using that internally at the moment? One of the ways we're using it is trying to get more sensors out in the public domain. We've done some programs with uh, distributed sensors before. This is one called Honeybox we're working on at the moment. So the idea is a cheap, uh, low interaction sensor. We can get many of them, put them around the world and gather central samples. Hopefully to get 100 plus sensors around the world operating 24-7. Uh, uh, centralized submissions coming back to one source. We can focus on the UI, the analysis tools, rather than data correction. This is basically just implementing what people expect we have running most of the time anyway. So we chose an uh, Asus EPC, a small Intel Atom CPU-powered box. Recently, you might have seen the Raspberry Pi. That's a very, very small, cheap computer. We're looking at using Raspberry Pi as well. So we can give away sensors for a few tens of dollars and get malware sensors on a much, much larger level. So at the moment, it's based on the Debian OS. Um, it's a simple system. You basically put the disk in the drive. You uh, hit return. It boots up. It runs a Debian OS. You get a working Dianair system out of the box with no configuration. For our members and our partners, you then go to the HP Feeds website, you create an auth key that allows you to send data to a channel. You then, as a user of the channel, run a command line two to subscribe to channels, you gather the data, and you download the data. So any of the HoneyNet project members can now access all of our shared data, including HoneyBox data. And we're looking to try and extend this this year to our partners, people in the community, people who are interested in working with us on threats and attacks. So if you are interested, all we need for you to host a sensor for us is a public IP address, either your own hardware, or we can send you hardware, or an ISO image in a VM. You just have to be willing to share some basic data, source IP, downloads, that kind of thing. And if anybody here is interested in um, larger scale deployments, we're a volunteer group. We're always interested in talking about sponsorship and funding, trying to find ways of getting more sensors out there in the public domain. So we've been experimenting with user interfaces. Over the past couple of years, we've built various uh, sort of uh, JavaScript-style UIs interfaces for navigating through malware results, sandbox data, 
Um, we started off doing some basic sort of charting and graphing the data, the usual kind of management porn. And recently we've been using Splunk, which is a commercial tool, but they have an open source community edition that's free. So we're using the Splunk version to do uh, various graphs and charts. We'll be making this available to all of our uh, members on the HoneyNet project this week at our annual workshop. The idea is anybody can go in and run arbitrary uh, data queries against a whole shared data set. Usual kind of management graphs. You've seen Splunk before, geolocation, that kind of thing. Also things like live attacks where uh, data is appearing on charts and some kind of particle effects where you're seeing attacks come in real time, ASNs appearing, ISPs, that kind of thing. Obviously, we work on visualization, the usual stuff, so your Google Earths, your charts, your heat maps. One of the things we're finding is we scale the data sets. If you have uh, tens of events, it's easy. If you've got tens of thousands, it's not so easy. If you've got a billion events a day for config or sinkhole, which this is, it's a pretty challenging data set. So we're going to be talking during the workshop about big data. And one of the big problems we have going forward is how we as a group manage big data. We're also working on simple um, animations, those kind of things, and more fancy management dashboards as well, usual stuff. So the feature for this project is to try and get, we have about 30 or 40 sensors live at the moment. We're going to be trying to get 100 by the end of this quarter. We have hardware to give out to all of our members at the workshop this week. We hope to have a chapter um, deploying a sensor in every country in the world if we can. We've already got places like China, Iran, Korea, which are quite interesting for um, the different views it's giving us of data. And our ongoing process is to work on the user interface and try and build new analysis tools for centralized data sources. So that's a very whistle-stop tour. Um, you can see we've built a whole bunch of Honeypot tools. Um, this is pretty much over the last decade, all the tools were built. Some of those tools are getting long in the tooth, quite old now. Some are still actively maintained. So we have some challenges where we take it going forwards. We're also using our tools to do some analysis. We said we would focus on active threat defense. So some of the members are working like Tillman at the back on botnet takedown. We're trying to do that in a responsible way. We've been publishing papers, Dave Dietrich, Felix, and Tillman working on papers on ethical disclosure, how to take down botnets in a responsible way. And then we're doing training for organizations who are facing these threats, things like the NATO, CCD, COE, where we're running uh, training classes for their members. So hopefully we're trying to use our tools and our knowledge in a responsible way to help people address the problems they're facing today. So where does this leave us going forward in the future this year? So great news, on Friday we were accepted by Google for GSOC, Google Summer of Code this year. So that means we'll be taking students on board in the next few weeks. We've got a public mailing list, we've got a public ISE channel. The application starts on March the 23rd. If you're interested, URLs at the bottom, please take a look. So sales pitch, uh, we want you. If you're a student and you want to do a cool project where Google pay you for three months to work on this stuff, come and talk to us. If you want to mentor a project and you're interested in being involved in supporting it, please get in touch. If you just want to help out and you have ideas, we'd love to hear what they are. So please get in touch about that. Obviously, we have annual workshops. That's uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Mexico, and Paris, now this year here at Facebook. So this year at our workshop, we're trying to present what our current chapters are doing on our private days to each other, understand more about what we think our research priorities should be going forward. We'll be looking at things like GSOC, what we can do is short-term three-month projects and tactical tools. We're also looking at the, the bigger picture of what happens next. And that's what Jose is going to talk about on the next talk. So one of the questions I have as the CRO is, is there anything left to do? Have we done everything there is in the honeypot space? I don't know. Um, there's a whole bunch of tools we have to maintain and work on, so we still need to keep maintaining those tools. That's an overhead for us as volunteers. Are we the right people to be maintaining these tools? Are there other ways of doing it? We'll be discussing that this week. Client honeypots are still proving challenging, getting high performance, scalable client honeypots. Uh, mobile honeypots, we haven't done Apple, iOS yet. Hypervisor layer, we haven't really been able to get into the hypervisor layer and extract data as much as we want to yet. And then the kind of enterprise scalability and making things more production operationalization, that's a big challenge for us. And finally, the, how we actually interact with our data on a big data set, the visual programming environments, how you can give non-technical analysts ways of interacting with the data, that's a big challenge. So our workshop is part of a two-way conversation. We really want to hear from you what you think we should be doing, what you think we should be working on. If there are things you think we don't do and should do, please tell us. Um, I'll leave these in the slides, but I won't really go into much detail. We've been discussing internally ideas for what we might work on. There's a whole bunch of topics here, things like anything from IS malware, uh, in-memory forensics, new visualization tools, open source intelligence gathering, things like mining paste hub and GitHub, uh, paste bin, sorry, in GitHub for extracting compromised credentials, uh, integrating with enterprise products, 
um, more education, building spam pots, um, VM protection for people deploying in the cloud, hypervisors, those kind of things. So this is the kind of stuff we'll be talking about at our workshop with our members. Um, if you think there's other topics we aren't talking about, please let us know. So that was a very, very quick talk. Um, covered a lot of material very quickly. The slides will be on the public website. There's a URL for all the tools. If you want to find more, check out the URL or come and talk to us during the workshop um, at the social event tonight. The members who wrote the tools are all here, so we can answer questions or join the mailing list, talk to us at IRC, and get in touch. So I'd just like to thank all of our GSOC students for just being great students. They built some really awesome tools over the last three years. The mentors for supporting us. Um, Google for funding us uh, in Google Summer of Code. We've had about, I think, $150,000 worth of funding for student projects, which is pretty awesome. And uh, all of you for using our tools. And then finally, Facebook, thank you for hosting us. We appreciate it. Uh, it's going to be a great week. And then thanks for putting it with me and a very rapid fire talk. <laughs> so I think I'm probably out of time. Um, I don't think we'll take questions on this topic now because it's a very broad topic. It's probably better to come and find us at the breaks or lunchtime or this evening at the social event. Uh, I imagine there's a lot of things to talk about, so let's try and discuss those things then. Thank you.